I work in the area of environment and development with a special focus on North-South relations, uh, rich-poor relations. I think the biggest impact I've had so far is trying to put the North-South dimensions, the rich-poor dimensions, equity, justice, uh, into the environmental uh, debate and into environmental science. And it has probably been most effective in the way we were trying to work on the Global Environment Outlook Report, which is a project to understand the state of the art of environmental problems worldwide, and it is requested by governments. When we started working on this report, I wanted to bring the social and development and equity justice issues on board. And I was told informally that that's not in the mandate of the United Nations Environment Programme, that is done by the United Nations Development Programme. And I argued back that since 2015, it's been globally agreed that environmental and developmental and economic issues are interlinked. And you cannot deal with one without taking the other into account. And Towards the end of the process, we were able to convince everybody involved and so the report became much more focused on the human dimensions as well as the ecological dimensions of the problem. When you start writing a report like this, there's a mandate and you need to stay within the mandate. And uh, for example, we were told at the start that we should not be talking about degrowth and questioning the major growth paradigm. Um, we sort of smuggled it in in other language and it was very clear towards the end that the policy makers understood what we were saying because they came back and said to us why are you vilifying development, why are you vilifying agriculture and so we had these debates the whole time as to what causes environmental problems and should we actually turn around and look at what is development and what kind of agriculture should we have. But I must say that that was also a very interesting learning process where you have to argue and defend your report to national governments and then you hope that in the process you've educated them and they'll go back home and at least some of them will try to implement your results. One of the key sources of greenhouse gases is the rich world. And we have an energy intensive lifestyle. We continue to use fossil fuels. And that is one of the primary reasons why you have the climate change problem. And it's not just our emissions today, but our cumulative emissions since the post-industrial era. And so that's the relationship between what we have done and the luxury that we enjoy and uh, the possible impact somebody else far away in the world can experience. In my youth, when I was uh, studying law and working part-time in a consumer organization in Ahmedabad, in India, uh, one night there was a huge accident in Bhopal. Uh, this was an accident at the Union Carbide factory and it led immediately to the death of 10,000 people. It made me wonder why and how these kinds of accidents can happen in a subsidiary of a big multinational based in the United States. That anger led me to focus much more on North-South issues and uh, double values it's with respect to large companies and uh, environmental aspects and social justice issues. A new opportunity to try and make impact is my uh, research on climate change and fossil fuels. This is funded by the European Research Council. This project looks at large investors like pension funds, uh, banks, um, philanthropies, um, multinational corporations on the one hand, and how can we convince them to stop investing in or using fossil fuels. And on the other hand, we look at the developing countries that have just discovered fossil fuel. And they also uh, want to use these fossil fuels because they think they will become rich fast. But we are trying to understand what are the conditions under which they will also leave the fossil fuels underground. The problem is that the fossil fuel world, world is worth between 16 and 200 trillion dollars. And there are a lot of vested interests who don't want to change um, the current status quo. And so we really have to figure out a way to develop evidence and to use a theory of change to create impact by using our evidence to feed various actors like social movements, policy entrepreneurs, local leaders in order to put pressure on these various actors to change their uh, behavioural patterns. 
But what does a scientist need to be able to make impact on society? I think the most important characteristic you need to have as a scientist that wants to make impact is courage and the ability to make strong statements and not be so nuanced that everything is lost in the process of communication. You know, a lot of people will come back and tell you that you need to focus on win-win solutions, you need to come with a story that you can sell, you need to come with a narrative that uh, attracts the press and the public. And uh, I begin to think that sometimes you also need to have lose-lose stories. You need to tell them that we will lose if they lose. You also need to know how to communicate to the other parties. You have to engage with them over time to be able to convince them. In the environmental world, we have assessment reports such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Global Environment Assessment. And these reports assess all the scholarship on environmental issues to come up with a consensus report. But if you look at the social sciences, we hardly have any global assessments of what are the social problems and what needs to be solved and how. And this, I think, is a real big challenge because we cannot come up and speak with one voice. I think science should be developed from the, on the basis of uh, let everyone do their own thing. But if you really want to have impact in the real world, then we do need to come together now and then to come up with a common consensus view, which is based on the scholarship.